I'm so excited to have all of you joining us tonight for uh, one of the presentations I always look forward to. Our presenter tonight is Aaron Likens, an award-winning public speaker, an author of Finding Kansas, Living and Decoding the Enigma of Asperger's Syndrome. He is an autism ambassador for Easter Seals National, and he is a blogger. And on the weekends, you might catch Aaron handling flags at the NTT Indy Car Series. Aaron was diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome, also known as Autism Spectrum Disorder, at age 20. He began collecting his thoughts and experiences on paper, the highs, the lows, the challenges, and the unexpected joys. What he found was hope, not only for himself, but also others with Asperger's Syndrome and Autism Spectrum Disorder. You're gonna hear more about that in his presentation tonight. Aaron also writes a daily blog each week called Life on the Other Side of the Wall. Aaron was the 2012 recipient of the Missouri Champions of Mental Health Award. And in 2013, he received the Youth Leadership Award for the state of Missouri. Since 2010, Aaron has given over 1,000 presentations, reaching more than 95,000 people, students, teachers, parents, police officers, professionals nationwide, and is a regular presenter to the FBI. His passion in life is to raise understanding of the autism spectrum disorder. I have two degrees in social work, and I can tell you no one has raised my understanding of autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's, and life uh, with those challenges more than Aaron Likens has. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker tonight, Mr. Aaron Likens. Wow, thank you. What an introduction. Yes, my name is Aaron Likens. I uh, am an autism ambassador for Easter Seals and as, uh, as mentioned, also author of the book Finding Kansas, which is about my life with Asperger's. But myself, my diagnosis came later in life, age 20. But just because I got diagnosed later in life, all the signs were there ahead of time, but nobody knew what to make of me. And at every parent teacher conference, my parents heard the same thing. Well, you know, your son, Aaron, he, he doesn't associate or socialize too well with the other kids, but you know what? Uh, don't worry about it. M maybe he's smarter. Well, my parents, they had selective hearing. They only heard the second half of that sentence that I might be smarter. So they took that as a sign that they were the best parents in the world. And I still think my dad has those words bouncing around in his head to this day, but what did my teachers mean by I didn't associate or socialize? Well, it started in kindergarten, and I have to say I love kindergarten because in kindergarten, we got to play with these very fun thin-sided blocks. There was a six-sided honeycomb thing, a green triangle, blue square, and putting those together sensory-wise, <laughs> I don't want to say my life peaked in kindergarten, but I have not found anything as fun as those blocks. Those blocks were, <laughs> wow. Anyway, uh, my classmates always try to join in the fun when I was playing with those blocks, but well, here's the thing. They sort of were doing it wrong. Maybe they used a little bit too much yellow over here, maybe a little bit too much orange over there, but they were doing it wrong. So I would go over and tell them, actually, no, I'd go over and destroy what they were doing. And I'd say, no, you're doing it wrong. Destroy it because in my mind, there's the right way. And in everybody else's mind is the wrong way. But that's a conversation for another day because I still may think that from time to time or all the time. But going back to when I was in kindergarten, I did try to socialize with my classmates. I didn't go about it in the most traditional of ways, but I tried. I grew up in Indianapolis where springtime, severe weather, a constant threat. And here's the thing about weather. One, I did find it really interesting. Two, I was absolutely deathly afraid of it. And I was sure every single day a tornado was going to come and wipe Indianapolis clean off the map. Sure of it. So picture this, I mean, kindergarten, mind you, but having a conversation or attempting to have a conversation with my classmate about very simple topics, such as the National Weather Service and the threat of a tornado watch because of the jet stream that's intermingling with the low pressure system that's going to bring up some of the Gulf moisture. Yeah, my classmates naturally would just slowly back away from me and I might as well have been speaking Martian if that's a language because they probably would have understood me a whole lot more than all this weather technical jargon I was saying but here's the problem 
being on the autism spectrum and not really knowing it yet. Um, well, we on the spectrum, we're not good judges at reading facial expressions. Most of the time, I'm not going to know if you're happy, sad, mad, or if I'm absolutely boring you to tears. So as my classmates backed away from me, <laughs> myself, I just kept up with them in perfect stride, giving them more weather information than they could ever possibly use. And I uh, have no idea I was boring them to tears. It did take about most of the school year, but eventually I realized I was uh, not being heard. So I gravitated towards talking to adults, either because they knew what I was talking about or they were very good at pretending I knew what I was talking about. But in first grade, I loved recess. Most first graders do. It's a grand time. You can run around, be loud, be obnoxious, expel energy. Myself, no, no, that wasn't recess. Recess for me was known as a 30 minute monologue with the teacher. It was great because in the morning I would draw a weather map and I would deliver the weather forecast. And on Mondays, oh, Mondays were awesome because I really brought it home. It was home with a five day forecast. So Mondays were looked highly uh, forward upon. But, well, not only did I give the weather, but I also gave a race recap of the previous weekend's races that were on television. Mondays and Tuesdays would, would be race recaps. Fridays would be race previews. And between weather and racing, I got to say, I love those recesses. My first grade teacher, on the other hand, with about a month to go in the school year, about this time of year, actually, she looked at me and she said, Aaron, 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 if you don't go play with the other kids right now, you're never going to recess again. Probably not the best thing to tell a first grader, but knowing what I know now, I can't believe it took her this long in the school year to finally issue that ultimatum because I talk nonstop 30 minutes every single day and oh, those are great days. But um, I understand what she was trying to do now, trying to get me to socialize, but um, I still gravitated towards talking to adults thereafter. Well, second grade came around, new problem popped up. And this problem, well, I learned the patterns of the school's fire drills. That may not sound like that big of a deal, but a high percentage of us on the autism spectrum, roughly 80%, 80% of us on the spectrum will have a sensory issue in one form or another. Now, for some individuals, it might be in certain types of fabrics. Others, maybe certain types of lights, but my sensory issue is to noise. And when I say sensor, sensory issue to sound noise, so often people want to think, oh, it just bothers you in your ear, right? So it's just like a noise that's too loud. Not really. When, when I describe a sensory issue, I can describe it in one of three different ways. One, oddly enough, it sort of feels like, uh, well, I said I learned the patterns of fire drill. So for a fire alarm, it sort of makes me feel like I have fire flowing through my veins. Two, if you've ever been driving and had a close call, somebody pulled out in front of you, maybe, maybe you pulled out in front of one, someone thinking you were clear, horns honking, screeching brakes, you know that peak adrenaline you feel, your heart rate just bursting out of your chest? Well, it sort of feels like that. Or example three feels just like two. You're driving down the interstate, you come over a crest of a hill, and there's a police officer in the median with the radar pointed in your direction. Even if you're doing the speed limit, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to get that momentary sense of adrenaline as you look down to make sure you aren't speeding. And examples two and three, if you want to attempt to relate what a sensory issue feels like, amplify it and sustain it. That, that's sort of what it feels like for me. However, going back to when I was in second grade with the fire alarms, I learned the patterns, but well, I experienced all this stuff each time a fire drill went off, but I'd look around the room and nobody else was fidgeting. Nobody else looked like they were in any pain. And I told you, I'm not a good judge uh, if you're happy, sad, mad, bored, but pain is something I can pick up on and nobody else was in any pain. So I could only draw one of two conclusions. Either everyone else was really strong or I was really weak. And in second grade or any grade for that matter, nobody wants to be labeled the weak one the wimp. So I didn't speak up about it. Well, I did mention the problem to the story was I learned the patterns. If we were going to have a fire drill, it was always on a Thursday, which doesn't that just completely destroy the drill aspect being random? Well, I picked up on the randomness of just being Thursday. So instead of speaking up about my uh, difficulties with the noise, well, talking about things so difficult for us on the autism spectrum. So for myself, it was just a whole lot easier. Well, 
I, I've now heard many presenters say that people on the autism spectrum may resort to a behavior to get out of an activity or task. And my behavior, every Thursday morning, I mysteriously became sick. And I be, I eventually got nominated for best actor in the categories of best headache, throatache, stomach ache that didn't exist. But I would do whatever it took not to go on school in those days. Eventually, my, uh, my parents did learn when I was or wasn't sick. So I upgraded my tactic, thermometer coffee works great to have a fever in the morning until you press your luck and you show your dad a fever of 107.7 and at that point in time the trick never worked again and even when I was sick I got sent to school back then so that really did backfire well years went on third fourth fifth sixth grade more problems popped up the ever-changing social dynamic confused me to no end but secondly sensory issues I'm already guilty of this, but if you hear any other presenter on the autism spectrum talk about sensory issues, so often we're going to talk about something to the superlative, to the extreme, such as a fire alarm or fireworks, uh, pots and pans clattering out of a cabinet, something to the extreme, but that's not the case. Not everything is going to be to that level for a lot of us. And one of my uh, most common sayings or a saying I think everyone needs to know about the autism spectrum. And that is that we on the autism spectrum can li live life unfiltered. In a classroom setting, what that means is it's very difficult to filter out the information I need to hear. So take a classroom setting or actually I'm going to take the room I'm presenting in right now. I'm at a hotel in Indianapolis, um, the IndyCar series, we have our first test at the Indy Oval tomorrow. But right now, just on the other side of this wall right here, there's a conversation going on, which keeping my stride as a presenter right now, very difficult. But go back to a classroom setting, 20, 25, 30 other students, instead of a wall blocking what's going on, you have people all around you. So every whisper, every breath, every conversation, I'm trying to listen to the teacher, but I'm hearing every other thing. And not only that, the gift I have of high, hypersensitive hearing, I would hear what was going being presented on in that classroom and that classroom. And for that classroom, huge advantage. I'm hearing tomorrow's lesson today, but going on over there, that was yesterday's and I already know that information. So now I'm having a really difficult time hearing what I need to learn today. So I've heard this from so many other teachers and individuals on the spectrum and from parents of those on the spectrum that my story was their story that first two, three hours of school went by great. You get to that 11 o'clock, that noon hour. I know for myself, I had absolutely nothing left. It took all my energy to pay attention and attempt to filter out what my brain couldn't filter out and come noon, I had nothing left. Absolute exhaustion. I, I say I was a good actor in second grade, but in the halfway through sixth grade, I was having horrible stomach issues, horrible headaches, uh, missed half the first semester. So I went to homeschooling. That worked great. But a year later, I decided I wanted to go back to school because in my mind, that <laughs> can't be as hard as I remembered. So I went back and it worked great for three days. Then the same patterns of behavior popped up again and we went back to homeschooling and that's where I finished up my schooling career. Flash forward five full years after that, uh, my uh, I had every diagnosis under the sun up to that point in time, but um, my dad wrote an article in Parade Magazine, which, uh, which was November, December 2003, and uh, there was an article in there about this thing called Asperger's. Before that point in time, I had every diagnosis possible, but as my dad read the article, something finally made sense. There was a reason. So my dad talked to my doctor. My doctor sent me to go get an assessment, got the assessment, went back to my doctor. And it's 2003. For, forget autism understanding or there was or acceptance. There was none of that. We weren't even to the autism awareness phase in society. My, my doctor didn't know what Asperger's was when the diagnosis or the the uh, diagnostic uh, screening came back and there was no doubt. He didn't know what that meant. So he read the assessment going, uh-huh, uh-huh, reading this here, yep, oh, oh, yeah, well, there's no doubt about it. You have Asperger's, um, good luck, good luck, okay. I was just given a diagnosis I had never heard of. So if you're like me and you're given a diagnosis, there's only one place to turn to. That's known as the world's most trusted place for information also known as the internet. And well, first thing I read on the internet, December, 2003, made a bold proclamation. It stated that those with Asperger's will never have a job, 
will never have friends, will never be happy. Horrible, horrible, horrible introduction. And unfortunately, I believe those words. And in life, autism spectrum or not, in life, if you believe the no's, don'ts, and can'ts, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's what happened to me. I became, oh, bitterly and extremely depressed. But 15 months later, I sat down at my computer and I, uh, I started to write, which was really odd because I hated writing. I, writing was the worst thing imaginable in my life, but I started to write and I never intended on writing a book. I just wrote, so maybe my parents, well, I just wanted to tell them who I was and why I was because I couldn't speak it. So I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, eventually I got the book and uh, it became uh, the title of Finding Kansas. And I have to begin with why my book is called that. Uh, so come on, PowerPoint. Yeah. So uh, to begin, uh, first off, my book is not a geography lesson there. I have found Kansas before. Unfortunately, okay, if you've driven across the state like I have, I've done so uh, five times and it's eight hours across. So they state actually owes me 40 hours of my life. So and uh, not only that, uh, it's Kansas Turnpike from Kansas City to Lawrence and you have to pay them for the honor. So <laughs> No, not a geography lesson. Second, if people guess what my book means, see, well, the only thing that they'll come up with is it must be a Wizard of Oz uh, concept. Nope, has nothing to do with the Wizard of Oz. And with a title like Finding Kansas, it sounds like it might be a treasure hunt. Nope, not a treasure hunt. So what it is about, obviously, it's about my life with Asperger's. So since I'm not talking about the physical, literal state, what am I talking about? Well, picture it this way. What if you were socially paralyzed in every state where, yeah, except when you cross into the borders of Kansas, everything becomes just a little bit more normal. Now, I've changed the way I present that. I've kept the original wording of my presentation in 2010, where back then the word state, normal. So back in 2010, I was still under the belief that normal existed now I say, if uh, we find that one normal person on the planet, congratulations, we have found the most boring individual in the galaxy. So normal, in my opinion, doesn't really exist, but, but, but wanting to become more normal, I think that's an appropriate term. And when I'm within Kansas, that's exactly what it is. Uh, conversations become easier. Go back to when I was in kindergarten. Uh, you could say auto racing and weather. Those two things were Kansas. I could have a conversation about those and everything just worked. Now, let's say we go off to another state such as North Dakota, which I've been picking on for 1000 plus presentations. I've only seen one license plate uh, from there. I've only met two people that have claimed to have been from there. So, and you never hear any news stories from there. So quite honestly, it may not actually exist. It may be a government conspiracy and we may only have 49 states. Okay, it probably exists. And someday I'm probably going to give a presentation there and I'm gonna have to change this story real, real fast. But until that day, the opposite of Kansas will be North Dakota. So when I'm within North Dakota, things take a little bit longer. Processing takes longer and things just, you ask me a question, I'm not going to have the answer right away. And I know we live in a society where everything is now, now, now. So I try to give you an answer, but I'm not going to come up with one. So I'm just going to tell you, I don't know. And well, so between those two examples of having answers instantly or over processing, where would you choose to live? Hopefully your answer would be Kansas. Although as I did say, driving across the state and eight hours of your life, you can never get back. And of course the Kansas Turnpike, which the prices went up four years ago. It used to be like $1.50. Now it's two twenty-five. dollars It was 75 cents more expensive and you don't get any more bang for your buck. So <sighs> So what is Kansas besides the most boring job in the universe? It is uh, the activity or interest of the person on the autism spectrum is obsessed with, and as my dad would proudly say, won't shut up about. He wrote my PowerPoint and he's had to put up with me for 39 years. So I'm going to let him have that statement because it is true. Whatever Kansas is, we'll talk about it nonstop for two hours and I take a breath and have absolutely no idea that you're not listening, but trust me when I say I'm going to have the time of my life. Oh, that's a mouthful, really hard to get out in one breath, but when we start talking about our Kansas, we may start talking at that accelerated rate. My first grade teacher, prime example, she didn't see me speak to any of my classmates, but get me talking about weather or auto racing. And it was a train going downhill full speed on and on and on. And because of that, Kansas is where we feel normal. 
um, we'll do everything we can in a conversation to try to steer it towards our our Kansas, whatever that may be. And um, from other kids and adults I've come across, uh, there are top seven things I've seen Kansas be and other individuals. Dinosaurs, uh, sharks, trains, movies, weather, anything that has to do with the military or airplanes or anything that has to do with computers, electronic games, and video games, specifically the video game Minecraft, which Actually, right now, I'd put that at number one by at least three and a half parsecs. There is nothing close to it, but we'll do everything we can to get to it. And there is, um, there is a beautiful thing about this concept of Kansas, and this, in my opinion, is the number one most important statement anyone and everybody needs to know, and that is if you've met one person with autism, you've only met one person with autism. One person's Kansas could very well be the next person's North Dakota. For myself, Take um, take auto racing. Uh, that's a hectic environment, uh, noisy, loud, and for some individuals, that's going to be way too frantic of an environment. Um, for me, though, my opposite of Kansas, as bad as fire alarms were, the sound of live drums. Truly, worst pain I've ever felt. Yeah, I know of a family south of St. Louis and Perryville. This mother had three daughters. They all were on the autism spectrum, and they all were drummers. So this right here makes it so difficult for general society to understand the autism spectrum because same diagnosis yet can be two opposites. Now, everything I've said, of course, uh, Kansas is everything. And Kansas for me most certainly is auto racing. And, uh, and during the introduction, yeah, I am one of the flaggers for the NTT IndyCar series. And it's, uh, <laughs> I still can't believe I uh, got to that level. Well, while I was writing, I didn't just want to write, I'm on the autism spectrum, here's why it's difficult. No, no, no. I wanted to come up with the, with the mechanics of the behavior, so to speak, uh, sort of the whys, not the what, but the whys. And one of the first concepts I came up with in my book was film theory or firsts. And for this concept, imagine the mind on the autism spectrum having a camera that uses real film. And anytime there is a new event, a new situation, a new person, a new anything, imagine the mind taking a snapshot, printing the film, and putting it in a portfolio. Now, anytime that situation or what have you is duplicated, we on the autism spectrum, we already know what's going to happen because what this concept states is that the Asperger mind or mind on the autism spectrum is controlled by these firsts, and everything must always be like it was the first time. So another saying I have, I believe this is the fourth most important statement that I came up with. And that is, whatever happens first, always has to happen. A couple examples to back that up. When I was 12, the AMA Supercross series came to St. Louis for the first time. Uh, I think they were there just nine, 10 days ago, but um, that's the indoor motorcycle racing series over the dirt jumps and all. And in 1995, my dad took me, we went and over the course of the evening, I got hungry. So we went to the concession stand where my dad found out hot dogs were somehow $5, so does $7. He laughed and he said no. What he did say though was that we would eat at a diner on the way home and we did. One year later we go to the same race. Now I know what's going to happen. I have this film to go by. I know what's going to happen. I know I'm going to get hungry. I know I'm going to ask for food. I know he's going to see the prices and say no. And after he says no, he's going to say we're going to eat at that diner. Everything happened to the letter, except he didn't say we were eating at the diner. However, I knew we were in the trap I fell into that night. And this is the third most important statement. I was operating under the system of I think, therefore you should know which means if I think it, if I know it, if I expect it, if I remember it, why do I need to let you know? Since I know it, you already know it. On the way home, we got near the diner and I didn't hear my dad's turn signal come on. And that's relevant because I used to let my dad know every traffic law he ever broke. It was probably really cute when I was five. I still do it. I am not a good passenger at all, but there went the diner and I turned to my dad. I was so confused. Why weren't we slowing down? I said, dad, diner, 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 diner. And well, we ate at that diner that night and every year since up until April 9th, 2011, I was in Joplin, Missouri, giving a presentation. So that 16 year streak came to an end. And the only thing I'll tell you about that presentation is be very grateful. You weren't there for that one. I needed tissues. It was awkward for everyone. I talked about this for 30 minutes. So be very thankful 11 years has uh, moved on. 
Well, another example, uh, this also has to do with food. My first presentation, I was hungry and whatever happens first always has to happen. So I'm stuck giving these two food examples. But uh, when I was uh, five, the elders of my dad's church treated family, uh, treated the family to lunch at the Olive Garden. My dad was a pastor up in Indianapolis. And well, that after that Sunday afternoon, we went to the Olive Garden. Uh, and that concerned my dad because I was one of the pickiest eaters in the world. I have a, <laughs> at that point in time, I only ate two and a half foods. I either ate macaroni and cheese, hot dogs, or pizza on a good day. Still really wasn't buddy buddy with pizza yet, but now <laughs> uh, pizza most certainly is where it's at. But those are my two and a half foods. And well, I also have another rule about food. This is very important to me, and that is food upon upon any circumstances should never be allowed to touch. Food needs to stay nice in its own little area. And oh, if you could see my aunt's uh, doormat that she has, uh, and she got it specifically for me. Um, I'll never forget the first time when I walked into her place in Washington, D.C., and there it was greeting me because, well, the reason why that's relevant in Washington, D.C. was every Thanksgiving we'd go there and oh, my dad and aunts play at Thanksgiving. It's not a plate of food. It is a haphazard pile of chaos. It is every single food of Thanksgiving piled up into one big blob, and it is wrong on so many levels, and it actually has levels, but... Um, my aunt every Thanksgiving. She goes, Aaron, sweetie, Aaron, look, 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 the food's touching. Look, I love you. Look, well, fittingly enough, uh, I mentioned the doormat in her house. Fittingly enough, it proudly proclaims you're not in Kansas anymore. So she moved to St. Louis a few years ago, and I, th I think maybe that doormat was the first thing to come out. So the, the blob, I, I like this time of year. We're still seven months away from the blob coming out of hibernation. So as we get September, October, my presentation tone changes just a little. Well, going back to the story, I'm five. We're at the Olive Garden. I eat those two and a half foods. I want a hot dog, but the Olive Garden being an Italian chain, don't serve hot dogs. As my dad informed me by saying, Aaron, <laughs> it's not in their business model. What? Come on. I was five. I didn't know what that meant. I still barely now know what that means. All I knew was that I wanted a hot dog. I wasn't getting one. So my dad looked over the menu and ordered manicotti, figuring that would be the safest bet to macaroni and cheese. The manicotti came out, and you see, here is the problem. It was sort of like macaroni and cheese, but macaroni and cheese doesn't have this weird red sauce on it. Side note, a school I presented at just five months ago when I mentioned uh, pasta with the red sauce, they asked ketchup. I said no, and sort of made a sensation, like I thought it was really gross that um, it, I mean, ketchup, and then like half the class that they put ketchup on macaroni and cheese. So still getting over that one as well. But uh, no, the, the marinara sauce on the manicotti wasn't what I was used to. So I went on a hunger protest because I wanted my hot dog, but well, uh, typically I would probably get a second chance at a different meal for my parents. But since the elders of the dad's, of my dad's church was paying, uh-uh. I, I was, they let me know I was either eating the manicotti or I wasn't eating lunch. And I tried the manicotti and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked it so much that every time thereafter, it wasn't the Olive Garden in my mind. It was manicotti bill because in my mind, that's the only thing they served. Now, when I was in fifth grade, I finally tried the breadsticks. Yum. When I was 18, I finally tried the salads. Okay. But that's what I got. Well, June of 2010, uh, a parent at a presentation asked me, okay, Aaron, you get the same thing every single time. What would you do if they said they were out of manicotti? Well, I laughed it off because one, I don't do hypothetical that well. Two, they've had it forever. Well, three days later, I go to the Olive Garden. I order the manicotti and cherry Coke. Waitress leaves, waitress comes back, places the cherry Coke on the table. And she then said, sir, as of last week, we no longer carry manicotti. You what? I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what to say. And one of the reasons why whatever happens first always has to happen. The reason why it's so important is this. If I know what's going to happen in the order that it's going to happen, we are taking the processing element of life and tossing it aside. It doesn't matter. And when things go slightly askew, well, 
in this instance, I stared at the waitress and I probably creeped her out because I stared at her like this for 45 seconds. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. It took me 45 seconds of realizing I had to ask for a menu. <laughs> menu, what's that? I never used a menu because whatever I got first, I would always get. And in result, I, I called for a protest of the Olive Garden until they brought it back. And they did bring it back only for a month. And I'm over the protest now. Their lasagna is not bad, but oh, things would just be better if they would bring back the manicotti. Well, this is a soda can. It represents a potential associative memory system. Not every person on the autism spectrum is going to share this, but it is mentioned in the DSM that those on the autism spectrum may exhibit an inappropriate attachment to objects. I have to admit, I somewhat take offense to that term inappropriate because to me, it makes perfect sense. I have a videographic memory. I can remember places, uh, events, uh, scenery to great detail. People, not so much. It's like an undercover news show, out of sight, out of mind. Now, I'll remember a person if I see them again, but go around a corner, I'm probably not going to be able to describe what they look like whatsoever. This doesn't mean I just completely forget people. My system is different. Um, I remember people through numbers, words, food, smells, but the number one way I remember a person is through physical items. And when I was 12, I had a friend stay at my house all night. And when while he was there, he drank a Minute Maid orange soda and placed it on my dresser. Very quickly, that soda can became more than a soda can to me. It was my connection to my friend. I knew I had a friend through that soda can. So it stayed there a while, a couple days and a couple weeks and a month, three months, six months, one year, three years, five years later. I went to a race car driving school in Las Vegas. And while I was out there, my mom thought she would do me this really big favor and clean my room. First thing I noticed when I got home wasn't that I could see the floor for the first time in half a year. Oh, no. First thing I noticed was that that soda can, which meant so much to me, was gone. Tossed out like a piece of trash. And end result, I cried more over the loss of that soda can than I would over the eventual loss of my two cats and dog. But they weren't a person. That soda can was my connection to a person and poof, gone, deleted from history. Side note, if my mom would have asked me if it meant something before that day, odds are I would have said, I don't know. How could I have described? I, I was the least emotional person in the world back then. I wouldn't have been able to describe what that soda can meant to me. So each person may have his or her own system, but if there is an inanimate object hanging around, it could be the system in play. Side note to this. I uh, lost track. Um, the friend of the soda can moved away in 2000. So he disappeared and he has a common name. I couldn't find him. I, I did maybe a once or twice a year social media search, but two years ago, I did find him on LinkedIn. So I sent him a message and he said, oh, I remember you. And then I said, hey, I have to admit, I've told the story about the soda can you place on my dresser. And um, he just responded back, soda can? What soda can? I drink a lot of soda as a kid. So that, that right there shows the difference between one person's uh, everyday irrelevant item becoming another person's this means something. So uh, I, I, I find that so unique in that. Well, while I was writing, I, I was struggling coming up with a social situation that anybody could relate to because it's one thing for me to say, yeah, when I go out in public, I sort of sort of have a hint of social anxiety. Okay, I, I knew I could do better than that. How could I come up with a situation that anyone could relate to? And when I learned of the theatrical term, the fourth wall, oh, I nailed it. So what the fourth wall is, for an actor or actress on stage, there's four walls. You have the two side walls, the third wall is a backdrop, and well, right now I'm not exactly on a stage, but if this were a television program, I would be breaking the fourth wall if I did something like that. That turn and look right at the camera. Now I'm acknowledging that you're watching. So the fourth wall would be if I were in a television production, the camera lens would be the fourth wall and I would not acknowledge that you're there. But there is another term out there called breaking the fourth wall. That right there, prime example, looking at the camera. Not too many plays break the fourth wall. Not too many plays, you know, well, acknowledge that the audience is watching or you're there and let's say you go to a play it is your favorite play it is safe to say this play is your kansas you're in the front row and the main actor is giving the big heavy powerful lines a line that the play is famous for and let's say mid monologue mid sentence all of a sudden he looks down at you makes direct eye contact and says yeah excuse me yeah yeah you um 
What do you think I should do next? Even if you have the script memorized, at that moment in time, I can almost guarantee that you're on the one-way ticket to North Dakota. You're going to be over-processing. You're going to have no idea what's going on. And, well, you're eventually going to think, hey, yeah, that guy's being fired after tonight. But still, you are not going to come up with an answer. For me, that's what social situations are like pretty much on an everyday basis. I may know the script of a conversation, much like you, with that play you know the script you could feed the actor the line but you're not going to know is that appropriate is that what you do what, what's going on here for me in social situation that is the common outcome and i said i may know the script of, of a conversation and i struggle with common greetings how are you is so difficult What's the criteria for how I'm doing? Is it what happened in the past week? Because if we're talking right now, my goodness, let me tell you about Thursday and Monday, uh, Thursday and Sunday's travel woes that I had. A four hour trip turned 14 and a half hours. And um, well, if this were out in the public, I would probably give you another five minutes of details of things that happened on that day. And you'd be back and away just like it was kindergarten or you were my kindergarten classmate. And well, the thing is you asked how I'm doing that's how I'm doing. The number one thing though that breaks the fourth wall for myself is eye contact. Uh, eye contact, extremely difficult for me and I will do everything I can out in public to avoid it. I mean, I'm a pro at, you know, doing one of those numbers to app make absolutely sure I'm not gonna make eye contact with you because I've learned, I learned at a young age, random eye contact initiates a random conversation. And since random conversations are hard and may include greetings such as, how are you? Therefore, eye contact is to be avoided. Once a conversation is in play, my eye contact may decrease. If it's a noisy environment, I'll either need to look right at your lips moving to match the audio tracks because I'm hearing everything else, or I will often look at the most static point of a room where typically where all the walls come together to really focus in on what you're saying. Because if I make eye contact with you, I am registering the signals I can't understand. The, I'm not gonna know if you're happy, sad, mad, bored, but I'm still receiving the signals of what a face is doing. So don't get me wrong, eye contact is something that should be encouraged, absolutely. But in certain situations, I may just quite simply not be able to give them. I gotta say, I love games. Games are amazing, games are awesome. And the number one reason why games are amazing are rules. Rules are awesome, rules are great. And when I was five, there's only one thing I wanted for Christmas and that was Monopoly. And I did get it Christmas at 88, much to the dismay of my dad because I, I had the rules memorized already the first night and the whole family played that Christmas at 88 and I beat everyone I won and my dad never played Monopoly again true story. He's been monopoly free since 88. And somehow uh, I'm really the only big game fan of my family uh, growing up. So I have no idea how that happened, but games weren't on the high list of uh, my siblings or parents. However, I uh, now use monopoly. Well, I have to give a public service announcement right now, because I said I did have the rules memorized when I was five. And this public service announcement, there are some of you out there and you're gonna know who you are that play Monopoly with house rules. Maybe a free parking jackpot, maybe double the salary for landing on go. Come on, <laughs> find those in the official rules. They, they don't exist. And if you are one of those types that play with those house rules, shame on you. The rules are printed. They're called the official rules of Monopoly. They come free in every box. Please read them, adhere by them. Thank you. And yes, I do know there is a house rules version of Monopoly now, but that's a completely separate game from the official one. So please read them, adhered by them. Thank you. Now, why did I give this public service announcement? It, it goes just to the, it goes perfectly with why socializing is so difficult for me. I'm still trying to find that one size fits all. Everybody plays by one set of rules because for us on the autism spectrum, in terms of socializing, the being able to adapt to different situations is so difficult because one minute the rules are this, the next minute the rules are that, and we on the autism spectrum are left wondering what just happened. Let's use Monopoly as, as an example. Let's say you roll the nine and land it directly on boardwalk. One, you cannot roll a nine and land directly on boardwalk without the help of the chance card, but 
while you're processing that logic, I'm just going to keep on talking and make things more confusing because currently on Boardwalk, there are 32 hotels and 19 houses way against the rules. And you would need three Monopoly games that have that many hotels. And I don't even want to calculate what the rent's going to be. But not only that, you, congratulations, you have landed on a triple word space. The word fraud currently is on luxury tax. So maybe you can, can you play a five word uh, play? Hopefully that'd be worth a lot of points with the triple word space you're on. And oh, by the way, you, there's a king on boardwalk being checked by the knight around the corner at community chess. So you'll have to deal with that as well. Huh? What is going on in that example? Is it Monopoly? Is it Scrabble? Or is it chess? I just described chaos. And first on the autism spectrum, so often that is what socializing turns into. Best example of someone not having major issues with uh, the rules of the game at a, at a point that it was kind of serious. This happened, uh, this did not happen to me, but this happened in the St. Louis area, October, 2013. And a 18 year old got pulled over. And this 18 year old was on the autism spectrum and officer came and tapped on the window. Well, nonverbal social cues can go 26 and a half miles over our head. So the, the knocking on the glass without any other prompt just meant someone was tapping on glass for some unbeknownst reason. So the 18 year old looked at the officer, waited for directions, none came and looked forward again. Well, of course that made the officer none too happy. So the officer pounds the glass. This annoys the person on the spectrum, not knowing why there's a racket going on. And he looks at the officer and goes, what? and looks forward again. Now the officer, irate, pounds a glass and demands, sir, roll down your window now. Person does so, rolls down the window and very calmly asks the officer, oh, <laughs> why didn't you say so in the first place? Story goes downhill from there. The officer then asks the unfortunate worded question of, sir, can I see your license? Person thought about it for a moment and said, no. Now the officer, he's at his wit's end. He looks at the person and very coldly says, sir, can I see your license now? The 18 year old, he uh, thinks longer and harder about it, trying to figure out what type of trick question this was. And eventually he laughed and said, <laughs> no, you still can't see the license. Well, um, he was immediately arrested, taken to the station for obstruction of a peace officer's duty. And thankfully, the officers at the station had autism training and they were able to read between the lines. They realized that this individual wasn't intentionally trying to be obstinate or defiant or any of those other really cool long words. Um, so no charges were filed, but per protocol, his mom had to come get him. She's in tears. This 18 year old, extremely smart, missed out on Valid Victorian by just a fraction of a point. Um, so the mom picking her son up out of jail wasn't exactly something she thought she would ever do. Uh, she gets her son, she's in tears, and she says, son, why didn't you help the officer? The 18 year old was just as confused then as he was at the beginning of the whole, whole ordeal. And he said, but mom, I was trying to help the officer. He kept asking if he could see my license. How could he? It was in my wallet. For those of us on the autism spectrum, we may have a literal interpretation of question. So can I see your license? There is nothing that says the wallet needs to come out. It needs to be opened up. License needs to be found, taken out easier said than done a lot of times and handed to the officer. Five-step process only implied. And we on the autism spectrum may not pick up on understanding the rules of the game that words may have a double meaning and that a command may be in the form of a question. Another prime example I have of using games to describe um, difficulties is through this. Now, let's say you're playing chess, but I just want you to envision that you can't see any of white's pieces. So when white makes this move and you're playing as black, you have no idea. Think how difficult of a game of chess that would be. You still have to play the game. You still have to move but you're not gonna know if your move was good or bad until it's too late. Personal example, I had a girlfriend for many years in the early 2000s, right at my diagnosis. And when I got diagnosed, she too looked it up on the internet and she too got bad information. So she started backing away from me slowly. So I had to figure out if she still liked me and I came up with a great idea. 
And this is the epitome of making the wrong chess move and having no idea. Well, I had to see if she still liked me. So I came up with this great idea. In my mind, there would be no bad ramifications from this. This was a win-win. So to see if she still liked me, I decided I had to break up with her. And I did so on Christmas. And I did so via text message. <laughs> yeah. Now in my mind, she would simply call me and protest and everything would be fine. Never once did it cross my mind that, well, maybe if she liked me before the text, maybe she won it after. Never once crossed my mind. I stayed up till 6 a.m. waiting for the phone to ring. It never rang. End result, I've only talked to her twice since Christmas 2003. So did a number on that relationship, having no intentions of doing so. But at the end of the day, I'm okay that that nuclear meltdown of a breakup story happened because that was the first chapter I wrote about in my book. So if it weren't for that, I, um, I don't know if uh, I ever would have started writing. So when the book got published, the dedication, it was a no-brainer. It went to her. So uh, I'm okay that that happened. And well, uh, things happen for a reason. Well, uh, in Finding Kansas, I I've only read my book one time, and that was on the 10-year anniversary of me starting to write. But when I wrote it, I could not believe how hopeful it was. When I was writing, Hope was not a word I would use unless it had less connected at the end. Hopeless was essentially my language, but I couldn't believe how hopeful it was. Then in 2009, a nonprofit in St. Louis asked me to go through their parent training program, and I decided to do so primarily because they gave me the job title of consultant, and that sounded really cool, and I hadn't had a job in several years, so sure, sign me up, whatever. Not the best reason to go into something, especially something so important, but while going through the training sessions, I actually, for the first time in my life, got the accurate information about autism. And I immediately believed in hope. And this concept, which isn't in Finding Kansas, but this concept immediately popped into my brain. So for this concept, imagine the minds on the autism spectrum sort of as being wet cement. And let's say we want a patio. We're going to have to work with it relatively quickly to go from this to that. Now, while we're working with it, let's say it's a typical St. Louis summer day. Oh, you know, it's coming three months from now. It's going to be 125 degrees with 295% humidity. Okay, numbers might be slightly exaggerated, but it is going to be too hot to be working outside. So we finished the bottom half of this patio, but this top half, uh-uh, we're just going to leave it like this. Well, so too sort of the minds on the autism spectrum. All the data, all the research out there shows the earlier we work with anyone on the autism spectrum, the faster the rate of growth. So what that means is if we work with it the day we pour it, we're gonna have that. But if we come back in October, it isn't exactly gonna be moldable or shapeable. Now, that's what I sort of believed before I went through that parent training program. I didn't understand that, well, Going back to what my fourth grade teacher taught me, the Hoover Dam, it's going to be drying all the way through for the next 4,000 years. So there's always going to be that ability to find wet cement. Sure, we might need to resort to sledgehammers. Sure, we might need to resort to jackhammers to break up what's been laid. But there's always that ability to find wet cement. Not only that, every day is a learning experience. Every day, uh, well, I, I think back uh, to my school years that when I want behavior popped up, um, if teachers or my parents uh, did something right away, it prevents the, uh, I'll think of it this way. Let's say we do have that new sidewalk and somebody in the middle of the night scribbles so-and-so love so-and-so in a nice cute little heart. You see it a week from now, it's going to take a whole lot more work to in less, well, if you work with it today. So when it comes to the autism spectrum, sooner truly equals better because we've got to work with it anything while it is wet and when I see myself picking up uh, yeah, routines, uh, sleep habits, the, the longer I, uh, in terms of insomnia, if I can cure insomnia sooner rather than later, such as uh, going on six nights of going, oh, you know, staying up two extra hours won't hurt. Well, sooner truly equals better. So for me, I need to sleep early. Anyway, uh, sleeping schedules aside, things I've heard at book signings. Well, my book was originally self-published in 2008, and uh, some families uh, beat me to my own author event, which was really weird because I'm chronically early, but they came up and talked to me, and I, they told me about their school district. They were trying to get a diagnosis, but 
Uh, their, their son was there. I'm not a doctor. I can't give a diagnosis, but this was the quintessential case of Asperger's. But they said their school, the school counselor actually laughed at them, according to them, and said that, well, he can't have Asperger's because one, he gets good grades, and two, he can talk. So even if he has it, which he doesn't, even if he does have it, don't worry about it. Every child outgrows it by the age of 16. And according to the parents, it was delivered with that type of smirky smile. But I heard that story and I was just thinking, no way, somebody's going to buy my book. Wow. I have former book signings in St. Louis, one in Indiana, and everywhere I went, I heard the same story. Now, I'm not picking on any one segment of the population. It was sometimes a doctor, sometimes a teacher, sometimes a school counselor. It was always somebody different. But each time I heard that story, I thought, oh, my goodness, somebody's buying my book. No way. Then when I went through the parent training program, I uh, started thinking. And then when um, it still hadn't come full circle yet, and then a week after the parent training program, I went to, and I was given two tickets to go to a NASCAR race in Dover, Delaware. And I went and I took my aunt, the you're not in Kansas anymore, dormant aunt. And, uh, well, taking her to that race was one of the biggest mistakes of my life because her favorite event is, uh, her favorite sport is tennis. Her favorite event, Wimbledon, very classy, high, uh, and NASCAR race in Dover, Delaware. Not quite. So um, when they said, gentlemen, start your engine, she tugged on me going, Aaron, does that mean it's over? Can we go now? And I so badly wanted to say, who's not in Kansas anymore? <laughs> I, I didn't, though. Um, part of the reasons why, though, was as bad of a time as she was having, I was having a worse time. You see, I wanted to be a race car driver going, growing up. I got really, really close. I was a professional. I instructed at a driving school and well, it fell apart right after my diagnosis, but that should have been me out there on that racetrack. You should have been seeing me win more championships than any driver ever. And that race started, that race progressed. And my goodness, that race was boring. I, I don't think much happened that day. And when Jimmy Johnson won yet another race that year, I thought, wait a minute, it finally started clicking my brain. What good did he do by winning that race? Who did he help? Huh. Next day, I drove up to New York City to meet the woman, that the doctor that wrote the endorsement in my book, and she asked me a life-changing question. Aaron, now that you have a book out, do you still want to race? And I answered in a non-literal fashion. I said, yeah, I still want to race, but it's a new race now. The race is to spread as much awareness and understanding as possible because there is so much hope. There's so much potential out there. Only if people understand us. And besides that, it should almost be criminal for parents to be told, don't worry about it, they'll outgrow it. Because if parents of a three-year-old buy into that and the age of 16 rolls around, that's 13 years of concrete that didn't have to happen. So yeah, I'm in a new race now and the race is to beat the concrete. And as I answered that, I realized... Well, I never thought, uh, plan A was racing for my life. My saying was there was no plan B, but all of a sudden plan B hit me upside the face. This is what I've been doing ever since. And I wish I could take the, take the claim and say, it was just me that got me here. No, it was an army of individuals that helped my parents, my teachers that, um, my teachers that did do great things for me in the 80s and early 90s without having a diagnosis or the knowledge that we have today. So many factors got me here that um, I wish I could thank them all, but it would take way too long. The racing bug didn't end though. It was mentioned, but I do have to share this photo. Uh, that's moments before the 2021 Indianapolis 500. Uh, uh, life dream right there. I'm, I think uh, maybe only the eighth person to flag the race, uh, flag to flag in its hundred and 506 years, uh, history. So, um, somehow I'm going to utilize this more in the presentation, um, in the future. Still don't know where it fits in, but, uh, determination, never giving up, got me to the highest level of racing. I, I thought I'd win the Indy 500, but fewer people have flagged it than won it. Not that I'm overstating the importance of my, uh, of being the person in the flags, but quite an honor. I still can't believe it. There's all my social media uh, information as well. Uh, I think if there are time for questions, um, I think we will uh, do that. We do have a few questions for you, Aaron. Always a great uh, presentation. I, I always appreciate you sharing your story and your experiences with people. As, as I said, uh, 
I've been in this field for 43 years and, and no one has taught me more than you have. Uh, first question tonight is, do you work with officers going through CIT crisis intervention training? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, and when I was, um... When I was primarily based in St. Louis, I was part of the CIT program in St. Louis from about 20, uh, 2010 to 2018, 19. Uh, I did the post training in 2010. So most St. Louis County officers did get my presentation, uh, did CIT also in St. Louis City, Jefferson County and St. Charles County. I've also presented uh, for um, Eastern Iowa several times and one in Kansas as well. So yes, I've done a lot of CIT training across uh, and, the Midwest. As I mentioned in my introduction, you're doing a lot of work with the FBI as well, which is amazing. Yes, the FBI National Academy is uh, about 220 officers from all over the country. And the, the neat thing about that is most of those officers will be going to lead, uh, executive leadership role. So to present to them, we'll get it in their mind that when they go back to wherever their jurisdictions are, that that type of training, whether it's for me or any other person that can deliver a impactful presentation on training their officers on what autism may look like, um, perhaps why they, why we on the autism spectrum may do something and may uh, prevent some unfortunate situations down the road. That's great. Uh, we have a question here. How do you tell potential friends about your diagnosis if they don't already know because you're famous? Or how do you, how, or do you even tell people about your diagnosis? Yeah, it's, uh, in terms of disclosure, it's very hard for me to avoid it because one Google search of my name and there it is. So very hard, but uh, I'll, I'll say when, when I, my, my coworkers and IndyCar are such a good example of that. When I began um, with timing and scoring two years ago, uh, they, I just like in all of my other jobs on the first day, I didn't talk much. I was reserved and everyone was probably thinking, uh, does he talk? That's what it's like for me. And thankfully I had the words to advocate enough saying, I do have a thing. I am on the autism spectrum. Just give me time. Trust me, someday you're going to be thinking, will he ever not talk like for five seconds? But it, it, it took a while. It took uh, about half of the season in 2020, but by event six, seven, uh, they had given me time. Um, I, I think of a job I had a, at a video game store where they just tried to, and I wasn't diagnosed at that point in time. So there was no awareness, understanding or acceptance, but they just kept forcing conversations. And if, if you're forcing conversations that on the job that aren't work related and I'm not comfortable, I'm just going to seem completely aloof and walk away. And that's what happened at that job. But my coworkers, now that I work with an IndyCar, it is, um, it, each day is just absolutely awesome. Uh, and it started just by a little bit of understanding. So for myself, yeah, I, I will upfront let them know uh, just so there's no misconceptions of each person's going to have a comfort level of whether they should or shouldn't talk or mention it. As I said myself, it's kind of hard to avoid it. So I'm very upfront. But for those that have just an ounce of awareness of it, you know, the, the, they will probably give you the time you need. And it, it goes back um, to the chess metaphor I use. If I'm not comfortable, it's truly playing chess completely in the blind, but still trying to, I mean, you think about a coworker situation, if you, excuse me, if you have five or six people at once, that's like playing on a chess board that has five or six sides. It, a conversation is like trying to process infinity. And by the time I come up with something to say, an hour's passed, but they were so great. And uh, I wish I, uh, I don't know if any of them are watching, but I would thank all of them for uh, really uh, making it a pleasure to go to work. We have, uh, we're just slightly over time, but I wanna ask one more question. What's the best way for somebody to contact you? Um, it would be aaron.likens at yahoo.com. Okay. And then the, the last question of the night, um, any suggestions for a dating when you are socially anxious and awkward? I know that you had sort of a messy breakup that you mentioned, uh, but I also happen to know that uh, you are in a relationship now. So uh, any uh, suggestions on dating uh, for somebody on the spectrum? 
Well, I do know I'm probably the last person that should ever be giving dating advice. Um, I, I remember my college comp teacher said, never, if you write a book, never put a breakup story. It's all been done before, but I outdid that breaking up on Christmas via text message and the relationship after that in 2015, I did break up. Well, I told myself, you probably heard me in presentation say, well, I've learned my lesson. I am never breaking up via phone again. Well, come 2015, February, I did break up via a text message. Thankfully, I avoided the holiday, though. I didn't break up on President's Day or Valentine's Day. I avoided that one, too, but I, I don't know if I'm the one that really should be giving advice. But I, 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 the one advice I would say is, uh, it, one, it's important to know yourself on the autism spectrum, but if um, if the other person has zero reference and isn't willing to understand, you know, sometimes some of us can be literal and might not be able to avoid it. So if a person is then, I don't want to say using that against us, but isn't learning our traits and quirks, it'll be very, it'll be even more difficult to learn the other person's traits and quirks. So um, that developing that two-way understanding because I know it's much harder for me to understand outward because reading social cues, whatnot, but it can happen. It absolutely can happen. But um, finding someone that you're comfortable with on a two-way street, that's going to be the key. Aaron Likens, thank you so much for making a positive difference in this world everywhere you go, for okay. sharing your time and your stories tonight. Uh, I am so grateful uh, to have you as a friend and to have you as an advocate on this planet. Uh, I wish you continued success in your career. Be safe out on the track this season. Too many injuries in those stands. I've seen, I've seen too many <laughs> stories about it. If you wanna read those stories, you can go to his blog, Life on the Other Side of the Wall. Aaron Likens, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you.